Well, I think we'll get started with introductions and others might join us in a moment. I um, want to say thank you so much for your interest um, in this work. We are very excited to be here today. Um, we're here to talk about the student parent families at the center framework and roadmap to inform and advance equitable post-secondary pathways for parents and their families. We also have um, intersectional perspectives on the um, race, gender, and age dynamics that relate to this issue around uh, parents who are pursuing education. And we are um, very excited to engage you all in this discussion today. I wanna introduce you um, to, or introduce ourselves to you. So I'm Teresa Anderson, um, a principal research associate at the Urban Institute based in Washington, DC. And I'll let Maria say hello for herself and then pass it to Kate. Good afternoon. Good morning to those that might be on um, the West Coast. Uh, I'm Maria Williamson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm joining from unceded Lenny Lenape land where New York University is housed. Um, I work at NYU Steinhardt as a senior director of diversity, equity, and belonging. Um, but I'm also a PhD student in uh, the sociology of education program where I am um, ambitiously building a social theory called Black Matricentric Feminism. Um, uh, Ten years ago this month, I graduated as a student parent from Misericordia University. So I'm coming to this conversation both with um, research experience um, and also personal and anecdotal experience uh, for student parents and happy to be a part of the conversation. And I'll turn it over to Kate. Hi everyone, Kate Westaby. I'm a research associate at the Urban Institute, working with Teresa primarily around student parent work. Um, I'm also a student parent graduating um, in August is the hope, finishing my dissertation. Um, and I'm located on ceded Ho-Chunk territory in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and yeah, I was a student parent, began my journey being a parent as a teen parent, um, and then went to undergrad uh, my master's and now finishing my dissertation as a student parent. My son is telling me that I've got a lot of experience as a student parent, probably too much. Uh, so I'll pass it back to Teresa. Thank you all so much. Um, and now we want to get to know um, folks who are in this virtual room. And so we're going to launch a poll um, to just to understand who's here. So have you attended college while parenting? So feel free to put in your response. And Kate, I will use this moment to transition the, the facilitation to you because I think you're going to introduce this slide. So apologies. <laughs> um, so one person still waiting on, but we um, can go ahead and end the poll. Awesome. Um, so as it's nice to know, okay, so we have some um, student parents, um, one person who was previously a student parent, and then a lot of experience knowing someone who was a student parent, and then um, some people who don't know anyone who was a student parent. Uh, that's really helpful to know. So thanks so much. Um, so next, we are going to have also kind of another little poll um, that asks what percentage of undergraduate student parents in the U.S. have dependent children. So in chat, if you can take a second, think about like all the undergraduates and what percentage of undergraduates in the U.S. do you think are student parents or have dependent children? Type some numbers in chat. Take a guess. Michelle, 20 percent. Cindy, 20 percent. Grace 15, 12%, Andrew, 25%. Awesome, so we are going to um, share the actual percent. Um, and so actually 18% of undergraduates have dependent children um, and the so it's eighteen point four percent of undergraduates, but actually twenty seven point six percent of graduate students have dependent children. So a big variation based on um, whether you're an undergraduate or graduate student. Um, and just to note too that we previously these are the twenty twenty numbers. So these are the most recent NIPSIS numbers around 
um, undergraduates who have dependent children, but this is less than um, the 2016 numbers, so 20%, but we don't really expect that trend to continue. We're trying to figure out, is that a sampling issue? They sampled right in the middle of COVID as well. So is that having an impact on these numbers? Um, but uh, also surprisingly, there are over 4 million undergra or undergraduates and graduate students who have dependent children. So this is a really um, large population, but a lot of times we don't realize that they are in our colleges. Um, so I'm going to jump to some fast facts about student parents just to kind of give you the lay of the land of what we know about student parents. So student parents are often working. Um, so 42% of student parents are even working 40 or more hours per week while enrolled. So that is a lot of student parents who are juggling work, um, child care, as well as um, classes. So obviously they're more likely to then be enrolled part time and online than non-parenting peers. They also have similar GPAs to students who are not parents, but there is a really interesting gender phenomenon going on um, that male student parents, so if you're a student parent and a man, you are more likely to have higher GPAs than male non-parents, but the opposite is true. Um, they are very similar though, female and gender queer, gender non-conforming students um, are more likely to have lower GPAs if they're a parenting student. Um, so some gender differences, and we're not sure if that has to do with, um, you know, the, the like imbalance in care sometimes that can occur by gender, um, but more, we're going to dig into that more. On average, they have about two children. I wanted to do a really quick deep dive. So we kind of gave you the general overview of student parents. And my focus specifically in my research is around young parents in college. And so um, I've been conducting this study, looking at high school longitudinal study data, but then also partnering in a part participatory manner with young parents. Um, and so this data set um, asked three, about three and a half years after high school, how many young parents were still in college. And so um, unfortunately there is a huge um, issue with persistence in college, even if young parents are able to access college, which is a lot, is 42% less likely than their non-peers. Um, there is a, still a huge disparity in persistence and that young parents on the right, 50% um, were had no degree and were not enrolled um, three and a half years after high school compared to people, um, their peers who were not young parents had 22%. And then I also wanted to point out that there's um, no degree in being enrolled at a four-year institution was a lot less. So young parents tend to be at two-year um, two uh, community colleges. And that um, has obviously implications for longer-term outcomes, but also um, wanted to point out young parents as well, because they're a different population when you think about stigma related to young parenting resources. And so one of my um, participants, Alex, who's a Latina young parent, when she was talking about this data, I showed them this data and she was saying like, it's not just the money wise, it's the mental too, because going through college itself is super stressful with a kid on top. It's even more having a kid doesn't mean you're just dealing with the kid. You're dealing with financial issues, baby daddy stuff, other partners, family um, issues. What are they going to cook today? And then they have class. Um, thinking about daycare or childcare. And then like, if they have to spend an extra hour after class because they need to do a project, you can't because you have a kid and finding childcare is hard enough. Um, but then finding childcare for extra stuff is really challenging. Um, and so she just talks about like the financial part, it's mental, it's all these kind of different things. And we'll, I bring this up to talk about this for framework that Teresa um, is going to present later, but you can kind of see just all the things that are coming together for young parents um, that is challenging to, to um, navigate. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Maria, who's gonna talk about some more about the general um, student parent demographics. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, yes, I, from the last part of um, Kate's conversation, there's so much that is layered on top of 
the undergraduate student ex uh, experience um, in addition to all the things we already know about undergraduate students. Um, uh, some folks are navigating being adult and living on their own for the first time um, and uh, dealing with some, you know, considerable mental health or disability challenges, which, you know, generally higher education uh, researchers are trying to figure out how do we uh, reshape higher education to better accommodate these folks. But in addition to all those things, student parents who are also dealing with mental health, disability, and other challenges also are dealing with um, the intersectional challenges with in, in regards to race, gender, socioeconomic status, and ability status, and all the other things as well. Um, so when we know about um, lower socioeconomic status students of color um, is still true for student parents. It's just exacerbated because they also have dependents that they're caring for. Um, so when it comes to intersectional identities, it's also really important to understand and disaggregate what do the student parents look like? And we've seen a trend over the last decade or so that these identities are slightly shifting, but what is true is that student parents are likely to be people of color um, and also likely more likely to be women. Um, so when we look at this uh, visualization here, we see that the percentage of student parents is disproportionately female and also disproportionately people of color. And yes, please, if you have thoughts, questions, comments, anecdotes that you wanna share, please include those in the chat. Um, my research, I'm sorry, can we go back to the last slide? One second, <laughs> thank you. Um, my research focuses, uh, which is called Black Matricentric Feminism, is really just pointing out how the most vulnerable among our college students are Black and Indigenous women with dependent kids. And I'm, I'm going to speak to that a little bit more. But this most recent data uh, from the MSAS study is showing us that Pacific Islander, American Indian, and Black students that are uh, navigating children are making up a larger proportion of the overall undergraduate students that share that same racial or ethnic identity. So we want to understand what is changing, what is shifting, um, and how are their experiences. But one of the challenges that we're seeing is that this data is one of the only sources of data that we can actually look at and understand um, what these students are experiencing and then kind of look at some different intersectional identity. Uh, we are not able to just like drill down to the institution. A lot of institutions don't uh, collect this data. It's a huge challenge. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, in addition to the racial and gender identities of student parents, which is disproportionately female, disproportionately non-white, uh, we also have that a lot of student parents are mothers and single. So we might automatically assume that we're always talking about single mothers, but no, that's not necessarily true. There are married and partnered women that are raising children in college, um, but a huge portion of them are single, divorced, or widowed. And as we know, um, the societal conditions that uh, lead to single motherhood compound all the other things that they're experiencing as students, right? Um, so that's really important to understand. Um, also really, uh, I'm really, I wanna point out that there are gender queer, gender non-conforming or non-binary student parents that are also experiencing this. One of the uh, cornerstones of my work is intersectionality, um, but also I really love um, Patricia Hill Collins. I, I come from a black feminist framework and the concept of other mothering is also really important. Um, there are people that have caregiving responsibilities that might not be biological parents. We also, the data is not gonna allow us to always understand th what the different family structures look like, but we also want um, to acknowledge that caregiving responsibilities are not necessarily just the people that have given birth to children or are a biological parent of children, um, but they might still experience some of the same um, oppressive experiences in higher education. Um, and I'm glad that things like genderqueer and non-binary identities are also being captured. It's not perfect, um, but we are able to see the different structures aside from the heteronormative understanding of what families look like and what those experiences are like on campuses. 
one of the things also that I argue with Black metrocentric feminism is not just that we want to look at this as uh, the higher ed as a microcosm, um, like independent of the larger society. Uh, we know that, or researchers have been telling us for a long time, that higher education is kind of like a pathway out of poverty for student parents um, and women in general. Feminization of poverty tells us that the majority of children that live in poverty are in a family that's headed by a single mother. Um, in addition to that, we know that it's really, really hard to break that generational cycle of poverty if that mother is not able to achieve a bachelor's degree. Um, and now we're even saying that we need even more education, right, um, to be able to reach economic self-sufficiency. Um, and, and knowing that, right, and not having much of another alternative for um, that financial or economic freedom, uh, to reduce the racial wealth gaps and opportunity gaps um, that a lot of race scholars and people in general are studying. We're arguing that if we focus more uh, on the people that are the most vulnerable, namely black and indigenous mothers, uh, non-white mothers of color that are single in higher education, we can actually start shrinking some of these gaps. And some of the indicators that tell us that this is true is how much student debt um, students have. And when we drill down and disaggregate, we see that on average, um, the student population that carries more debt than any other student group is Black women with children. Um, and so when we argue like cancel all the debt, we're not just saying that because the millennials are tired <laughs> of carrying around six figure debt, um, but it's also a racial equity issue, um, a, an intersectional racial equity issue. When we look at who is struggling the most with home ownership, um, entrepreneurship, um, and staying above the poverty line, even when they get to the finish line, if they get to the finish line of the degree, they still have these other barriers um, to get to a place of what they consider success for themselves. And I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I love, um getting into these intersectional considerations because um, there's a lot of opportunity to think about racial equity through the um, focus on parenting students and to think about broader, more equitable and more accessible education systems. So anyway, I just appreciate that. Um, I also wanna emphasize that even though we're talking about these challenges um, and burdens, we're talking about a very motivated population and a very high capacity population, especially you know, getting similar grades to other students um, and just being dedicated to higher education um, and furthering their education by the fact of continuing even while juggling work and school and kids. Um, because even though about 45% of student parents are in school, are working full-time while they're in school, about 70% are working in a non-work study job and the average is over 20 hours a week. So there's a lot of um, juggling. Um, so all that said, it can take many years for a student parent and specifically looking at student mothers to complete a degree. So this is based on a study I did of women who went back to school after they had children. Um, and what we see here is that when you compare women who went back to school um, with very similar women who did not, um, and you look at the amount of time it takes them to actually complete the next degree, we look at high school diploma, you see a lot of it's kind of in the first two years and then it sort of flattens out. Most of them are, are completing in those first two years. Um, when you add in college degree, however, it's a very different shape. You're seeing that even 18, 19, 20 years later, this line is going up and the women are persisting to try to complete these degrees um, even decades after they start. Um, you can look also at four-year college degrees, which has a similar shape, but is a little lower. The difference there would be two-year um, degrees and then um, graduate degrees as well, which can also take many years and doesn't have the same inflection point that you see in high school diplomas. Um, and ultimately, one third of student mothers complete a higher ed credential eventually, um, and but less than one quarter of mothers who did not have a college degree specifically ultimately completed one. Um, so as we talked about that, these are good students, um, but they have a lot of barriers to completion. And it's not just about personal barriers. Those personal barriers certainly do exist, like being you know, first generation or coming from lower income backgrounds and um, the intersectional burdens of um, being a woman of color uh, or uh, coming from other marginalized gender identities. 
But a big issue that we wanted to emphasize in this work is how systems are misaligned for student parents. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about those systems and also some solutions. We're not just problem. Um, we're not just sort of raising the flag about problems, but also to raise some opportunities. So with that, I want to talk a bit about the Student Parent Families at the Center project, which was um, an effort that Maria got to be part of on our fabulous leadership council. We had 45 members of a national leadership council. We also reviewed over 250 pieces of academic media and gray literature and coded it to the framework that we're ultimately going to show you here in a moment. Um, but just a wonderful range of um, expertise from across the spectrum of uh, policy and practice and lived expertise. So the framing of this is that systems are not designed for student parents. And uh, I think I imagine many folks here are either at or are familiar with higher education uh, contexts. And the truth about a US um, higher education is that it was designed for a certain kind of student. And the student that US college and higher education opportunities were designed for was male, he was white, he was a young adult, and he was financially dependent on his parents. Um, other groups weren't allowed to access higher ed. And so this is the group that, that our, our current systems were actually designed for. Um, and that student, he only had to navigate really one system, which is the one that was designed for him. I'm calling this college access and success policies. But his responsibility was to be a student. Um, of course, higher education has diversified enormously over time. Um, and that that sort of like modal student, whatever, it, or model student was is no longer uh, the majority by any means. Um, and um, when we bring in the intersectional identities, not only of today's college students, but particularly of students who are um, caring for children and uh, have other family caregiving responsibilities, we have a wide range of intersectional identities that come to the fore, as Maria just um, illustrated. And when you talk about folks who are in these um, intersectional identity spaces and student parents in particular, you actually end up, if you go through the effort of counting them, pointing together, um, identifying 11 large policy areas that those families are concurrently navigating, which include the college access and success policies that we identified for that quote unquote, big quote, traditional college student. Um, but also tuition assistance and federal student aid, which is an add-on to our higher education system and not a particularly well-aligned one, um, employment and the labor market, early childhood education and care, social safety net programs, taxes and tax benefits, universal and community-based supports, including you know, um, community-based organizational supports, public pre-K through 12 education, workforce and training systems, infrastructure, and finally what we're calling situ situational systems. So that could be immigration systems, veterans affairs, um, disability systems, uh, child support or um, child uh, uh, foster care system. There's, and that actually add layers of complexity to each of these others. And so we developed this framework and then we designed it to look pretty. So there's the pretty version. Um, and within each of these areas, of course, these are large buckets and within each of these, there are, I think if you count these bullets, 88 policies, programs, and issues that we identified that student parents are largely concurrently navigating, none of which have been designed in thinking about someone who is the head of a low-income family who is pursuing education and who um, is employed. And that's usually the, the situation parenting students are in. So we can zoom in on some pieces of this. So for example, under our college access and success policies, we can think about recruitment and outreach, orientation and registration, class scheduling. So some of those process issues around higher ed. We can also think about um, jumping down a little bit here, Title IX, Civil Rights Act, ADA protection. So thinking about kind of federal um, non-discrimination and supportive policies. We can think about things on the right-hand side here, like around college accountability policies and practices, accreditation bodies, regulations on for-profit colleges. These all relate very strongly to student parent issues. Um, for example, student parents are um, uh, disproportionately represented at for-profit institutions. Uh, in fact, I think we just saw a statistic that over half of students at for-profit colleges in the United States in 2020 were parenting students. Um, I think Maria has a couple of things that she could add to illustrate this as well. Yeah, um, I wanted to bring in a little bit more of an anecdotal um, 
uh, information that we can share here. Um, so in college access and success policies, one of the things that we have here is academic basic needs and legal supports. Um, a lot of uh, parenting students might be dealing with um, divorce or custody battles, uh, things that cause a lot of undue stress that make it really difficult to focus on studies and experiential learning and other things that are really important and integral uh, aspects of the education experience. So how can you uh, focus on a group project when you're worried about, you know, the custody of your child or having to co-parent with someone that has caused um, a lot of harm towards you and things like that. Um, one of the other things that I also wanted to mention, uh, I did a pilot study, as I said in, in the chat, of women from across the generations. And the one common theme, like all, everybody had different experiences with family support, financial support, childcare, et cetera. But one of the things that I wasn't expecting to come up was the word trauma. So, so many people mentioned personally that they were traumatized either in their uh, own you know, personal lives outside of the institution or within institutions. And this served uh, as a significant, this had a significant impact on their education experience. And it made me wonder about what education institutions are actually doing to support students that have PTSD or, or experiencing other levels of trauma and what trauma informed education or policy approaches like Kimberly Crimson Shaw outlines in her intersectional policy analysis, we could employ um, as stakeholders at institutions to make sure that we are accurately and adequately um, supporting student parents. Uh, thank you, Teresa Flick. No, I appreciate it. This is like, this is why we love <laughs> having the opportunity to talk together. And Maria, as I said, was part of the brain trust that helped develop this. And it's been so fabulous to bring in these um, perspectives that are, that deepen this work. I'm going to zoom in on a couple of other areas of this. I'm not going around the entire circle today, but I do welcome you all to look at it in some detail. Um, and uh, Kate, actually, if you want to drop the link, because I think we're going to share it later in the meeting anyway. So if folks want to squint at it themselves, they can. Um, but just zooming in on a few of these other areas, we have tuition assistance and federal student aid. Um, uh, this was developed a couple of years ago. So instead of EFC, now, of course, we have SAI with the new FAFSA. Um, but um, these issues around Pell Grant scholarships, FAFSA, federally subsidized loans, um, work study. I mean, Maria pointed out the disproportionate debt, the cost of higher education return on investment, student debt, low cancellation forgiveness that are directly related to students' parenting experience, as well as their intersectional um, gender, racial, and social identities. Um, and of course, we also have education, or excuse me, employment in the labor market, um, where it's interesting in qualitative research I've done, it's been really, in, um, I've heard over and over how important it is to have a supportive employer. Sometimes that employer is at the educational institution where the student, um, was there a graduate student, you know, having a supportive advisor or um, uh, if they're a staff member within their office, um, but uh, also in the private sector, the importance of the role of employers um, can't be understated for students being able to juggle the, the various responsibilities and trade-offs that happen in um, student parent spaces. And then just one last area to zoom in on because um, it's APAM and we know you all think a lot about these things, but early childhood education and care, um, thinking about the many policy issues around early childhood education, um, as well as social safety net programs, uh, cash assistance, food assistance, housing, healthcare, um, you know, heat and energy and disability um, among, you know, and within each of those, those, you know, even are lumping things together that are in their own way nuanced and complex. So there's oh, go ahead, Maria. Oh, so sorry, Teresa. Um, I wanted to throw in for those that are really like policy nerds like myself. One of the things that I found in my own research was um, the pivot that we saw with access to education uh, after the welfare reform in uh, 1996. Um, so previously uh, under um, uh, with federal assistance, uh, student parents uh, could receive um, cash assistance from the government all throughout their college experience. And then because of what I believe um, was a stereotype against the welfare queen, namely uh, the black woman um, mooching off of the government uh, while not working, the, the uh, welfare reform emphasized a need to work and college experience was seen as a luxury and not as job training or preparation. So it restricted from being able to finish your program while receiving cash assistance to only being able to do that with federal assistance for a year 
Um, now, this didn't necessarily deter enrollment in programs, but it definitely prolonged um, the experience because you could not, you had to work. Uh, while going to school as well. And you couldn't, you had to like navigate this tricky line of how much can I work even at an internship or a clinical placement that I need for my degree while also receiving my food stamps, my Medicaid and cash assistance that I need for me and my children to survive. Um, so I believe that welfare reform, which was intended, I guess, from uh, the Congress perspective on emphasizing a need to work and, and make money for yourself, um, it actually created a, a more exacerbated racial and gendered wealth gap uh, between white folks and non-white folks, uh, particularly student parents. That's so on point. Thank you, Maria. I want to um, pass this to Kate as well to share um, some insights from her qualitative work that draws that points out some of how these systems can all come into play, even in just like one um, quote. So go ahead, Kate. Yeah, so um, thank you for that comment, Maria, too. I think um, I see a lot of the uh, stigmatizing language for young parents in that welfare reform um, bill. And so you can kind of see like welfare queen, but also the stigmatization and how much those narratives have continued to take hold is really uh, problematic. And I think is you know, not allowing some of the change to occur that we would like to see. Um, so again, this is a participant, a young parent from my um, research who's an undergraduate student parent as well, was just talking about this one example of her experience um, trying to get, trying to like get this Medicaid insurance. And she said, it's so overwhelming. Her dad is changing his insurance. So I'm going to have to call Medicaid, tell them she got this new insurance, but just the thought of calling them stresses me out. She's like, you call a number, then they direct you to a different number. Then you're on hold for an hour. She's like, I can't imagine if I was working full time and because the hours of the Medicaid people are the hours that they are. Like, how would you even do this? She's like, it's stressful. And they do reviews every six months. And she had mentioned that she just had her six month review. When I talked to her, she said, my college doesn't send out the exact amount of tuition until August 16th, but the date she needed the information is August 5th. And so you can see the systems being really mis misaligned and having administrative burden. Um, and she's like, I can't give Medicaid the information when I don't even have it. And then she's got to do this all again in January. Um, so you can see that in this example, there's insurance, um, private insurance she's dealing with, Medicaid and social support networks, and then college as well, college tuition um, and those things. And so just to highlight the bubbles in the map that just this one quote is intersecting with, you know, um, tuition and financial aid, uh, social safety net programs like Medicaid, infrastructure, such as like how does um, insurance and private insurance work? Um, so you can kind of see in just these experiences with that one student parent, how many of these um, bubbles they're touching in their um, work. So I think um, we also want to take a moment to not just look at the bubbles around the outside, but to also emphasize this big one in the middle, which is about the families, um, the intersectional identities, group identities, personal identities, and experiential identities that um, student parents are, are um, that characterize student parent families. So I'm going to pass it to Maria to um, speak a bit more on this. Thank you. And I'm curious, this is going to be an interactive component. Um, I was wanting to hear from folks in the room right now uh, in the chat um, to take a guess at what 35% is representative of when we, when we think about our undergraduate student population. Any guess is a good guess. Okay, we have Andrew with first-gen students. Don't be shy, y'all. <laughs> Percent who prefer Pepsi over Coke. <laughs> single parents, students who come from single. Oh, hey, Nyjah. That's my friend, y'all. Students who come from single parent homes, good guess. Other guesses? Let's get one more before I do the big reveal. I 
I need one more guess, and we can sit here <laughs> <laughs> until I get it. All right, y'all win. <laughs> um, so the 35% is actually in reference to the percentage of all Black women undergraduate students who have dependent children in the United States. And so this is why we say that it's so important for data collection and understanding uh, what our students are experiencing, what, right? And this is actually a smaller number uh, for the most of the time that I've been doing this research, which is over a decade now. I graduated with my bachelor's degree as a student parent uh, 10 years ago this month from Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania. And at that time, it was closer to 50%. It was about 45% at that time is what the data was telling us, um, the percentage of all Black women in the country, right? Um, that were uh, raising children while also pursuing their degrees. We have a huge you know, percentage of those students that are at community colleges, at for-profit colleges and things like that, is trying to find a way to reach economic self-sufficiency. But even in places like New York University, at Rutgers University, um, at UCLA, um, at big flagship schools around the country, this is an invisibilized population. We see Black women students, um, and we already know so many of the other things that they're dealing with, that many other undergraduate students are, are dealing with. Um, criminalization and lack of support around neurodivergency and, um, and mental health supports and uh, campus sexual violence, like so many things that Black women students are experiencing. And then you add in the caregiving challenges and the experiences that they have with, uh, with raising their children. So this is just to illustrate how many, how many of the Black women that are enrolled as, uh, as students across our country are also student parents. To emphasize this isn't just a small population. Can we go on to the next slide? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out my mute button. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks. So we promised that we weren't just gonna like talk about the problems. We were gonna propose some opportunities. So that that's where we're we're pragmatic. We're gonna say, hey, let's find some solutions. So we were able to find actually many solutions to the systemic barriers. Um, which we share in the Roadmap for Change to Support Pregnant and Parenting Students, putting student parent families at the center of recommendations for pilot practice, policy, research, and investment. We label a lot of things version 1.0 on purpose because we know, first of all, that we didn't get every single thing despite our fabulous leadership council and review of the literature and um, you know integration in the field. And also we know that things change over time and the, the situation changes, even as we've seen some of these statistics evolve over time. Um, so please feel free to check this out, but I'm gonna talk you through it. Um, and so we have the uh, roadmap to the roadmap. So we've organized this as a series of destinations, one through eight, um, and I'll talk through these um, one by one, uh, but we hope that this is kind of a useful way of thinking about kind of big goals. And then along the way to those goals, identifying mile markers that you can try to reach. So the first destination is recognizing that awareness is fundamental for all elements of change. So finding common language, recognizing how student parents fit into access efforts in higher education, and collecting data to characterize their experiences and outcomes will all lead to greater awareness of student parent families and better outcomes as a result. Maria has been raising the, the specter of data as being so important and it is repeatedly identified as the first necessary step to be able to affect meaningful change. And in fact, we have a project about that, which I'm happy to talk more about later. Um, in the roadmap, I also wanna point out that we have a lot of detail around suggested approaches and examples, places you can reach out to, look at, consider as opportunities for actually doing this work instead of just putting out lofty goals without any guidance on how to get there. Um, we're also working on a like searchable, sortable version that's not just a giant PDF, um, which we're hoping to be able to release in the next few months. So um, keep an eye out for that. But I'll keep orienting you all to what's here because we think you know, it's a valuable resource in the interim. So the second destination is that student parent families experience less time poverty and have sufficient supports as they pursue education. So time poverty is not having sufficient time to meet work, school, and familial duties while practicing self-care which is important. 
and it's an element of role strain, and it's often exacerbated for parenting students by the various demands of the systems that they interact with. I mean, looking back to Kate's quote, that really illustrated that well. In addition to, of course, their important jobs as parents, students, and often workers. So easing access to existing supports and streamlining processes while developing new supportive resources and policies would really relieve that pressure. Um, we often advocate for design thinking. So when designing a program, uh, whether it's for the safety net or for educational programs, administrators could ask, what would these structures look like if they were made for a working student parent? And they could also consider different design approaches around those identity groups that we've talked about, whether it's a young parent, a black female parent uh, with a partner or without a partner, uh, thinking about a student who is not gender conforming and different ways of designing for groups that are higher, um, have great, great potential, but our higher needs can help su uh, support all of the intersectional identities that overlap in the student parent space, whether that's veterans, whether that's first gen students, whether that's black female students and so on. This third, third destination is that post-secondary education is financially feasible. So of course the costs of higher education are rising and affording college while navigating financial aid and managing debt accrued afterward are a challenge for everybody, but especially for student parents as we saw the disparities earlier. Um, student parents face higher costs uh, to support their families and find care for their children while they're pursuing their educational goals. And this is really an acute need. The fourth is that families' basic needs are met during and after education programs. So you all might be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but in that, physiological needs, safety, love, belonging, and esteem are all necessary building blocks to self-actualization, which is where education can fit. Um, so all stakeholders could collaborate to help students and their families meet their needs for income, food, health, uh, excuse me, food, housing, health, mental health, well-being, transportation, and technology, which is increasingly a basic need in higher ed um, to help them succeed in their schooling. The fifth is that student parents enter and complete education programs and attain good fulfilling jobs. So research uh, has shown that when student parents complete a college degree, their family's well-being improves over the long term. I actually have appendix slides on that if anyone wants some numbers, um, but the payoffs depend on the pathway chosen. So, um, and completion of course depends on receiving appropriate support in a program that fits the family's needs. So thinking about um, supportive employers during program enrollment and following completion that can facilitate um, long-term, both educational and career success. All these things are important in being able to get through and beyond. The sixth is that parenting students' children are supported. So student parenthood is a two-generation experience. So attention to child well-being is critical while parents are in school. And research shows that on average, children struggle when their parents go back to school and they display behavioral challenges, even though they do perform better academically and have some other long-term benefits. So relieve, relieving the burden on families um, by helping ensure that children are in good care settings and are part of the parents' learning experience in meaningful ways could be beneficial um, all around. Destination seven, colleges meet their goals by supporting student parents. So students and their families are not the only ones who stand to gain from efforts to support parenting students. So colleges themselves may experience benefits in recruitment and enrollment, um, promoting opportunities for equal education and attracting resources to the institution um, when they support students with families and um, the student body at large. So we see this as kind of a win all around. And finally, research and advocacy efforts around student parent services, policies and investments are sufficient and effective. So this is an ever shifting field. There's a lot of relevant policy systems. So elevating parenting students into leadership roles, building communication and collaboration channels and creating new supportive entities, as well as finding ways to support research and insight can strengthen the effectiveness and efficacy of, um, and efficiency, excuse me, effectiveness and efficiency of policy practice, research and investment. So that's a lot. We, I wanna point out that there's some appendix worksheets. Kate shared the direct link to the roadmap, but Kate, if you don't mind sharing the link to the landing page for the roadmap, I think that has the appendix link on it too. Um, and that can be helpful while we're still working on the navigable version for you to be able to go through if this is something that you wanna kind of dig into for your own context or partners. Oh yeah, and there's the link again. So that's what I just said, we're gonna have a new version. So just to kind of start moving towards um, wrapping up, I'm going to pass it back to Maria to drive home the importance of this work, and then Kate will close us out with a, a thought um, activity. So um, I'm sure all of you can 
make your own kind of generalizations about why this is important to you personally or why it should be important to policymakers or the institutions. Uh, but for the purposes of Black matricentric feminism, why am I doing this? Like, why is this important, right? Um, everyone knows that there are gendered, racialized economic disparities. Um, approximately 40% of single mother families live in poverty compared to 10% of married couple families. So as a nation, if we want to drive towards equity uh, for all segments of the population, then we ought to focus um, on, on single mothers. Uh, and obviously education is a way in which they're trying to do that. And this also disproportionately affects mothers of color. This is according to the US Census Bureau. Um, Education access, right? Um, we've already discussed how it's an important mechanism for them to exit poverty. However, when we disaggregate it, we see that even with those degrees, the, however long it takes them to get them, for some folks, it's about a decade or so, um, there's still barriers to getting to where they want to get the promised land of economic self-sufficiency. So there's still, even if we get people in institutions and get them across the graduation finish line, there's still so much work to do, but we still need to understand with the data what the population looks like and what they need. And we also want to stop the cycle of generational poverty. Uh, we've just discussed how higher education is beneficial, not only uh, to women or parents, um, but also to their children. Uh, the degree, there's been some other longitudinal studies that show that um, as a child witnesses their parent get a degree, it encourages and incentivizes their children to also participate. Um, with two of my degrees, my bachelor's and my master's degree, my children, uh, one of one or two of them uh, were at my graduation ceremony. As a matter of fact, when I got my master's degree from NYU, I took my toddler across the stage with me because I felt like it was just as much his accomplishment as it was mine because there was so much sacrifice and nights that he didn't uh, spend time with mommy because mommy was in class, right? Uh, and my daughter, who is now 16, um, wants to go to medical school. I wonder what her uh, her aspirations and her possibilities would have been had I not been able to persist through my degree program. Um, and also there are obviously racial wealth and opportunity gaps. We already see so many people are talking about the gaps between uh, white and non-white students when it comes to high school and college graduation, employment, et cetera, right? Um, so the benefits of a college education are amplified for Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Pacific Islander parents who generally face greater economic insecurity across all markers, right, that we uh, study for our country. Um, and in addition to that, if we want to focus all our, our human resource and our capital um, towards the most vulnerable populations, we, we really ought to consider student parents as an extremely under-researched topic um, that really could help us understand poverty and economic disparities as a whole. Um, I think that the federal government, most state governments, higher education institutions do not collect enough data, even in states like Oregon and Illinois, where there has been legislation that is passed for their state institutions to start collecting, that doesn't necessarily mean data automatically becomes available or that it's enough for us to understand what's really happening. So we as researchers are imploring all of you and all of your uh, whatever positions of power that you have or whatever your locus of control is, we, we really implore folks to start thinking about what small change can you make to start gathering data and understanding the student parent populations at your institutions or in your region. That's fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And uh, Kate, bring us back. So we wanted to give you a little bit of time to just really dig in and apply your thoughts to the um, bubble um, text, the framework. So I'm going to put that in chat. But basically, we're just going to, in chat, um, take a little time to reflect on your undergraduate college or K-12 experience. You'll pick one bubble in the link that I just put in um, that you had to navigate. And then in chat, or you are also welcome to come off because I think we're a smaller group of chat and say, like, how might your navigation of that bubble, that area or resource, have had to change if you were a student parent um, or if you were a student parent, I know one of you was, how is that navigation of that bubble area or resource different? Um, if you had different intersectional identities, would your experience have changed? How? Um, and so take a second to think about that.
So just to reiterate, we are picking the bubble um, or area of resource, reflecting on it and writing in chat. Um, how might your navigation of that area of resource have been different if you were a student parent? Did your intersectional identities matter? Would that have changed things? Just to help some folks, um, as you're reflecting on this, I'll share another personal or anecdotal experience. Um, if I had a different intersectional identity, um, how my uh, experience would have changed. Thankfully, I've always had, um, I've been physically able-bodied. Um, one of the issues at New York University is that it's not always a physically accessible campus. So I imagine that if I had mobility challenges or even a chronic condition, that had inflammation or pain that made it really difficult for me to climb stairs or walk around campus, how difficult it would be for me uh, to attend class. Like that is required for many folks, even after the pandemic to attend in person. Um, navigating New York City, which is not uh, always an accessible place and public transportation would have been almost impossible um, to get to class without uh, having supports around transportation and things like that. So some of the things that other undergraduate students are experiencing then add in the complexity of caregiving, um, you know, PTSD, uh, co-parenting challenges on top of that. So I imagine it would have been a lot more difficult for me to take on a full course load because that means instead of trying to get to just one class a week, maybe I'm trying to get to three or four. So mm -hmm. hoping uh, to hear more from folks about that reflection. Um, hi, I'm Nija, and I was looking at what the bubbles and college access and success policies and tuition assistance and federal student aid were really difficult for me because my mom was a single mom and she had only attended school here in New York and I decided to go to school in North Carolina and she had no context about all of this information and was unable to help me in the process. And so I had to do a lot of footwork and a lot of, um, I, I call financial aid, I believe every day for three months that when I arrived on campus, they came to meet me. Um, because they had to know who this student was who had been bugging them because I needed to know everything. Um, had I been a had I been a teen mom myself, I probably wouldn't have had so much trouble with the financial aid piece because once you become a parent, you're emancipated in the state of New York, and that would have translated to North Carolina. And so I had to get information from my parents, and both of my parents refused to sign the paperwork because their understanding was you're going to school, I'm not going to school. Why do they need my information for this? And refuse to give it to me. So I had to work with financial aid to become an independent student and legally get them to say that they were not filing for me for their taxes and that my tax information was adequate. So I think there, there's some there's there's some highlights. Um, had I been a teen mom, it wouldn't have been so difficult. I wouldn't have had to fill out all this paperwork to make this thing happen. Whereas having parents who were single parents and had no contact, it made it that much harder. Yeah, thank you, Nija. That was, that's really interesting. I, yes, was automatically an independent student because I was a teen parent, but I remember like my mom coming, we went to this non-traditional student services to help me fill out FAFSA because I had no idea how to do it. She was, I was first gen. So um, like just the, having the support of someone on campus, even though it was a non-traditional student services, even though I was, you know, regular college age um, was really interesting, but navigating that as a teen parent, I had no idea. I still like, feel like there's, I'm just scratching the surface of financial aid. There's so much to know with that. Um, 
I I love this. Uh, one of the things that I've been looking at um, when it comes to advocacy with policy for student parents uh, and it comes to FAFSA and federal student aid, um, when students, if they even like New York students leave so billions of dollars on the table when it comes to federal aid because they just don't fill out the forms. There's a lot of mistrust between communities of color and the government when it comes to sensitive information already. Um, but then when we when we think about the people that are filling out the FAFSA and do receive Pell Grants because their expected family contribution is zero, I've argued that student parents should have a negative uh, expected family contribution because to go to school, they have to pay for childcare, which isn't incorporated into the typical uh, like tuition calculation or the cost of attendance at institutions. And so if we're trying to build an equitable structure, we should consider that maybe student parents or folks with dependents to receive more federal aid uh, to support childcare, which is exorbitant, right? Um, in New York City area, uh, when my child was a toddler, I was paying about $1,100 a month for childcare. Um, which is impossible to think about an undergraduate student on minimum wage on an on-campus position being able to afford that um, to attend class, right? So thank you so much for sharing that, Nigel. There's so much complexity there um, that we ought to continue to have a conversation about. I wanted to elevate. Oh, thank Oh, oh yes. Yeah, sorry, Teresa, did you want to speak about um, your comment? Well, yeah, I was going to say about like to, you know, responding to Michelle's reflection about the requirement for community service hours and these leadership courses. And I was uh, just the, we've heard of many student parents who have, they might be in a program that has on the job training, like clinical rotations or um, like teaching. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I did teaching and I can't remember what it's called, but time mm -hmm. in the classroom. Uh, practicum. Practicum. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they might have be in a, um, social assistance program that has work requirement and then they might have a scholarship that requires volunteer or community service hours and I heard one case where someone was sort of able to get like the same thing to sort of count for all three by just not being very like kind of keeping it a secret that they were trying to triple count it which is legitimate because how are you supposed to be doing a school be a parent and have like three part-time jobs that um, only you know two which don't even pay you um, to be able just to like maintain your basic financial support and be able to make progress in your program um, and maintain the, the supports that you need. So the misalignment of these things is like a lot of the emphasis around the roadmap and the, and the framework around trying to think about where can we even make relatively small changes so that it's just not quite so impossible for some people. Yeah, for many women that I've spoken to, like one of the two of the most popular degree programs for women around the country are teaching and nursing, right? Uh, continue to be. And both of these require experiential learning hours, right? Like you're going to have to do some practicum, some clinical hours in order to, and when you think about the hours that are required to do this, in addition to your course load, those hours conflict with time that you need to be helping your student with homework. Uh, putting your kids to bed, making dinner, things like that. Um, and so it's a huge like navigational struggle to figure out where you can dedicate your time and be multiple places at once um, so that you can get all the requirements that you need. So you got to think it's not just about how long you can sit into in your butt in the seat in a classroom, but also all the additional requirements that you need in order to attain that degree and how these things are not designed for us. And I wanted to highlight Myra's comment as well, um, but study abroad. Uh, there's a class that's taught here at, at uh, Steinhardt called Internationalization and Study Abroad. I am now at almost 35 years old for the first time in my life actually able to do a study abroad um, in South Africa this summer as a, as a doctoral student. I never had had the opportunity to do that in an undergraduate or as a master's student because it never made sense for me to be able to go away for two, three, four, five, or six weeks at a time without my children. Most programs do not allow for you to take anybody with you um, as a caregiver or et cetera. And then you already have out-of-pocket expenses for like travel and things like that. And so this really important experience for many students is not able to be met 
um, by student parents or by people in color in general because of the the uh, that the costs associated with it. So how can we be more flexible around this? Um, my office designed a study away program in DC, which allows for us to help people that may not have all the documents they need to travel internationally. We offer housing um, to students and their parents, faculty or students and their children, faculty and their families. And we engage them in a study away experience at no cost to them. We cover their travel and meals and everything. And I did this because of my own personal experience as a student parent that really wanted an opportunity to go away, understand a different aspect of culture and learning um, and get to learn firsthand um, through my, with my own eyes, how things are happening in the real world and not just in the classroom. So I really appreciate that comment, Myra, and uh, just really wanted to elevate that. And I want to keep this conversation going. I just changed the slide so that we could just say like, hey, we're doing some cool stuff. So check out the Spark Collaborative, Student Parent Action Through Research Knowledge is trying to bring lived expertise, research and knowledge development to um, policy practice investment and research um, and further research for student parents. So we just literally rebranded like one second ago. And so this is our brand new logo and we're really excited about it. Um, and it's a cross organizational effort that is being stewarded by the pregnant scholar at UC College of the Law, San Francisco Urban Institute and Child Trends, but it's going to have a lot more opportunities for broad engagement. So just like check out our website and we're, there's a newsletter. We're gonna have a new one going out today. So sign up and we'll add you to the list. Um, but please, yes, I continue to reflect on this. I'm going to go back. I just want to make sure people had a chance to like catch that if you had to sign off um, soon after the hour. Um, and ha also happy to take any questions that folks might have. Obviously, there's so much we can't fit into this presentation that we've researched or witnessed or seen. Um, so yes, in addition to your reflections, please let us know if you have any questions that we can maybe get to in the next few minutes before we have to close. Hey, I just wanted to like, sorry, this isn't really a question, but I just had to comment on the dorm piece because there was a student I heard about um, at a college in Maryland that got a full ride scholarship that included cost of attendance and included housing, uh, but they would only give her housing in like a freshman dorm and she had a kid and she's like, I can't have my kid in like a freshman dorm with like roommates like on campus and they would not accommodate supporting any other housing. So she lost that like component of her award and had to pay for housing out of pocket and she did end up making it work but it became a big question about like is that a title nine violation like what needs to be accommodated from an institutional standpoint um and is it fair for for her to have to give up on that huge support for her education um in that way um and related to the other scheduling point i was thinking about these stories but like a student who was in nursing clinical program where the nurse the clinical rotation ended 30 minutes after the latest childcare pickup could possibly happen, she was about to leave drop out of her program because she could not bridge the 30 minute difference um, and finally figured something out at the last second in that case. But people leave programs because of very minor things that can be resolved if people are focused on solutions. Absolutely. Go ahead, Maria. Oh, no, thank you. Um, I just like also wanted to, to share um, in reaction to uh, some of the comments that we're seeing here, like living off campus, how that limits uh, your ability to engage and things like this. Um, but one of the things that is really important, um, an aspect of the framework that I'm trying to build for Black metrocentric feminism is including caregiving status as a protected class or identity, much like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, citizenship status are all protected classes, right, in the, uh, in the Constitution. So people are not allowed to discriminate against you based on that. So the students that had the experience of not being able to accept a scholarship because of limited housing experience, I think if we are able to reconceptualize caregiving as a protected social identity, uh, and in New York, right, you're not allowed to ask people about their children in a job interview. I think we also um, ought to apply that nationwide and have a framework that prevents us 
um, from having de facto discrimination against student parents based on the way that housing and things like that work. A lot, the barrier to colleges providing uh, child care and uh, family friendly housing has a lot to do with cost of liability insurance. So we ought to push back on that and make sure that we create equitable spaces so that these opportunities do not slip through the cracks for student parents. Well, and to elevate that there are policy changes happening, although they haven't gone as far as we might have hoped. So there's new Title IX regulations that were released about a week ago um, that are much clearer about the role that academic institutions play in supporting students who are pregnant or postpartum and that they need to be doing much more to provide um, accommodations, to inform students about their rights, to ensure there's not discrimination happening uh, based on pregnancy and postpartum related conditions, um, and to provide lactation spaces on campus that are um, adequate and not just a bathroom stall, um, and things like this. We really pushed for extending that to parenting, um, but it was still pretty limited, but there's still opportunities for individual institutions to take it a step further or for states to be thinking about taking it a step further beyond just the postpartum um, period. I do see that we're losing folks and I don't wanna you know, prolong this too long. So I just wanna raise if there's any questions, we're happy to share the slides. I 